Good morning, everybody. Happy and Merry Almost Christmas. Today is the fourth Sunday in Advent. Welcome to worship today. Um, because I'm sure we're all, we're all thinking about Christmas, please notice in the bulletin, Christmas worship times. There's three opportunities, a 4 p.m. service here at the church, a 5.30 p.m. service here at the church, and a 7.30 p.m. Zion service. They will all have candlelight. Uh, December 25th, we'll have regular worship here at St. Luke, but it won't be Regular, regular time. The worship itself will be a kids' choir we're putting together. And by we, I mean Debbie is putting together for our, for our community on December 25th. Other things to look towards, our annual meeting is on January 15th. We need at least 60 people to make decisions at our annual meeting. So if you're wondering, is that my responsibility and you're a member? Then yes, that is your responsibility and you're a member. So please come on the 15th for our annual meeting. Um, other than that, look at the things happening in the, in the bulletin. Um, also, we get to celebrate, which is awesome during Advent, um, incarnation and new life, Lord's little Bridget. Bridget Dankers is going to be baptized today. She's right there. All right. Son of Brett, or daughter of Brett and Brittany. The last thing I was asked to make note of was, um, if you noticed, yesterday in the state of Minnesota, there was an amazing overtime victory of one of the... <laughs> the great Minnesotan sports teams. You think I'm talking about the Vikings? Seventh grade basketball. <laughs> I was asked to make note that, that Whitney Carlson had the game-winning three-point shot. So I don't know if she's here today. I think she might be. How about a little applause for <laughs> Whitney? That's super cool. And yes, the Vikings won, too. Get your, get your heads in the right spot, y'all. <laughs> Okay, let's pray as we begin to ready our hearts and minds for worship on this fourth Sunday in Advent. The Lord be with you. Father, we are one week away from Christmas, and we would like to roll into Christmas thinking less about all the things that need to get done and more about incarnation, how you show up in our lives. Give us space and place this week. To do that, help us to control the things that we can control, which is mostly ourselves. Help us not to get in our own way. And just open our eyes and ears and nose and mouths and hands and, and, and whatever senses we have to, to witness and be part of all the different ways you incarnate in our lives today. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. I will invite Robert Hinch up, please, for our fourth quarter. Our stewardship committee does quarterly updates. Here is our fourth quarter quarterly update. Thank you, Robert. Good morning. On behalf of the Stewardship Committee and the Church Council, I would like to thank you for all your contributions and gifts of your time, talents, and treasures. What an amazing year that we have had. We would like to start the next year as strong as we have finished this last, so we are asking for your continued support and prayerful considerations of your future contributions. Thanks so much, and have a wonderful Christmas season. Thank you, Robert. They probably hope the sermon's going to be that short. It won't be, <laughs> but they're hoping. I invite everybody to please stand. Today, friends, on this fourth Sunday at Advent, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. A moment of confession and forgiveness. In Advent, we, pray, we prepare for the coming of Christ let us open our hearts to God's mercy. Together, we confess our sins. Gracious God, we confess that we have sinned against you and against our brothers and sisters. Our words and deeds have not proclaimed your reign of justice and truth. We have failed to watch and pray for the signs of your advent among us. Forgive our sin and come quickly to save us. Children of God, hear the promise. The advent of Christ brings the promise of grace. Through Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Live as reconciled to each other. Amen.
We have lit three candles for hope, for peace, and for joy. Today, we light the fourth candle, the candle of love. With this flame, we signify the love of God that surrounds and fills us at all times, but that we recognize in a special way in the Christmas story. There is no greater power than love. It is stronger than rulers and empires, stronger than grief or despair, stronger even than death. We love because God loves us. Dear God, as our Advent pilgrimage draws to a completion, grant us the courage to share your love. Love for the unexpected challenge. Love for the vulnerable one. Love for the presence of God. Amen. The first reading is from Isaiah. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of a human? Will you not try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord said, himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey. And when he is known enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, but before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid to waste. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please all stand. Today on this fourth Sunday in Advent comes to us from the book of Matthew, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 1. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to his son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. You may all be seated. Somebody dropped a cell phone, I'm going to put it up here. You can check your pockets. Sorry. It's on 
on. If you check your pockets and you don't have your cell phone, that might be it. You can retrieve it after the service. Come on up, kids. <sighs> All right, let's talk about parents. So Jesus is going to get center stage and all the attention next week. But before we get to Jesus, we get to talk about Jesus' parents. And we rarely ever talk about Jesus' parents. I would like to hear from you. Can you tell me something that you learned from mom or from dad that you hope to do well someday too or that you really like and want to learn yourself? Can anybody tell me something you've learned or seen mom and dad too that you would like to do well yourself someday? I'll share mine, but I'm going to see if you want to share yours first. Anybody have anything? Okay, fine. I'm going to go first. So my thing is, uh, my dad is a really good runner. Guess how many marathons? Do you know what a marathon is? What's how many miles in a marathon? 26, yes. It's about halfway to Rochester. Maybe? I don't know if that's right. I think maybe 26. No, that's probably farther than that. 26 miles is a super long time. He's ran like 10 marathons in his life, and he ran them really, really fast. He ran them under three hours, which is, I think, under seven-minute a mile pace. When you guys do the school mile, the fastest kid is usually around six minutes and 30 seconds, right? If I remember right. So think about doing that 26 times. Anyway, I've always wanted to be a, a good runner like my dad. Never really got to that level, but I run because I saw my dad run and wanted to be good at it, too. My mom was a really good cook and a really good gardener. I am an okay cook and a below average gardener, but I want to get better at both, and it's nice that I have her modeling for that for me so I can keep practicing, because I'm still young. I got a ways to go. What about you guys? Tell me something that you've seen mom or dad do. Yeah. Cook? Okay, so do you want to be a good cook someday? That's cool. Do you watch her in the kitchen? Does she, does she measure stuff or just put stuff in? She just puts stuff in. She's a super good cook then. You should ask her when she's doing it, Mom, tell me how much and tell me how you know why. That'll help you learn that, okay? Who else has a skill you want to learn from mom or dad? From daddy? I hope you learn lots of stuff. Your daddy can fix stuff really well. What about uh, raise your hand if you like to shoot deer, okay? Did you learn that from mom or dad or grandpa? Okay, are you going to shoot deer? Who, who? Mom, dad, grandpa, grandma, who shoots all the deer in your family? Dad? Okay, is he any good? He is? Oh, he missed one last night? Kind of, are, aren't we out of season? Oh, okay, okay, bow and arrow. Um, so do you want to repeat that behavior? Would you like to, to actually hit the deer with the bow and arrow someday? Okay, cool. Raina, what about you? Micah and dad shoot deer? That's cool. Do you think Micah will ever be as good as his dad? Yeah, I hope so. Maybe if he practices. Anybody else? Something that you've seen your parents do that you want to do well too? Yeah? Drew, what do you see mom or dad do that you want to do? <laughs> I'm not going to repeat that. <laughs> I'll tell you later what he said. <laughs> um, yeah, you can do that someday too. <laughs> Let me get to the point. The, 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 point, the point of this is, and I want you guys to hear this in the sermon today, we, we kids, I was a kid once too if you can believe it, tend to model our behavior after what we see our parents do. And so it's really important to have parents who live faithful lives, generous lives, giving lives, and loving lives, because if we see that, chances are we'll be faithful, generous, loving, and giving too. So the way I'd like to end, because we talk about babies a lot on Christmas, I want you all to go back to your seats, and we're going to have a prayer for parents today as our ending to our children's message, okay? Go back and sit by a parent, and I want you to, I don't want you to uh, hold your parent's hand too. That was a fun children's sermon. Thank you for that. I will remember that until the day I die.
Okay, kids, we are going to be together in a prayer for our parents. Oops, my mic is all cat. Let me see. Are you holding on to a parent's hand? Okay. Let, well, you can't do that. You're holding on to hands. I'll clap. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for our parents. We thank you for the faithfulness, the kindness, the generosity, and the love they model for us. Help us, Lord, to grow up to be like mom and dad. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can I hear amen? Amen. Cool. Thank you, everybody. So today's, if you probably noticed by the children's sermon, today's message is going to have a lot to do with parenthood, which is awesome because we have a baptism today and you guys are just starting out and so you can think of all these things ahead of time. The question I want to start out with is, is we're especially going to talk about fathers today, fathers. So dads, you're all excited you came to church now, I bet. How important are fathers in the faith life of their children? This is a question the church asks on occasion and actually has some hard data for. There was a study made by the Swiss government back in 1994, and a lot of churches since then have modeled a certain amount of family ministry on this study, but it was a nationwide study by the Swiss government in 1994 to try to find out if they could tell what the effect of parents were on the faith life of their children. And they studied all kinds of different things, but what they found by the time the study was over was that if, if, if dad is a church-going type in the family, the parents have a 10 times greater chance of being a church-going person when they grow up. Kind of interesting. Moms had effects too, but interestingly enough, not as much as dads. They found out if Dan was a, dad was a praying person, if dad prayed with kids and whatnot while kids were growing up, kids had about a 10 times, everything is going to be 10 times, 10 times greater chance of becoming a praying person when they got older. If, if service or, or outreach, community outreach was an important part of dad's life, then kids have a 10 times greater chance of making service or community outreach an important part of her, their life. The point was, in the end, that dads have a lot of power over what happens to the faith life of kids as kids are growing up. Apparently, kids are watching their dads more than any other person in the family. Dads and grandpas and uncles, no pressure. There was another study done by a Baptist missionary uh, think tank thing that, that wanted to know about what the effect of parents were in the missionary field. So, so what happens when, when people are growing up in non-Christian cultures where somebody might not be born into a Christian family, but, but Christians are made more by conversion than by birth. And they discovered that if a child in the family was converted by missionaries and the child became a Christian in a non-Christian family, the chances of that family, any family member in that group becoming a Christian also was about 3%. 3%. So kids didn't have a lot of power over the faith systems of their families. They were mostly set by the time the kids were born. If mom in that family became a Christian, changed belief systems or, or, or um, pivoted a different way in belief systems, the chances of the family following suit after mom was about 17%. So it increases about five or six times from the influence of a child. If dad converts and dad doesn't about face to a different belief system, guess what the percentage is that the rest of the family follows suit if dad starts the process? I won't make you guess. It's 93%. Can you believe that? I was pretty shocked by that. 93%. Fathers are pretty important in the faith life of their children. Now, why talking about dads today? <clears throat> In Matthew chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 2, this is the one time in, the, in Advent, in the Christmas season, where Joseph, where, where dad actually gets center stage in Jesus' story. Most Christians, of course, will come to church on December 25th and December 24th, and we always read the birth story of Jesus from the book of Luke. And who takes, what's the, who's the parent that takes center stage in the book of Luke on, on, on the 24th and on the 25th? Who are we going to hear about? We're going to hear about Mary, and Joseph is going to be like the side guy that, you know, kind of was around, but, but we wondered what he did. But in the book of Matthew, Joseph gets center stage. In the book of Luke and in the book of John, neither parent is really mentioned. In Matthew, Matthew focuses on Joseph, and Luke, Luke focuses on Mary. One of Matthew's point for, points for us today is that the work of Joseph and the person of Joseph and the life of Jesus is really important to how Jesus 
grew. In fact, and you can look at this if you go home, we start today's gospel reading at verse 18. If you go home and you look where Matthew starts at verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, we get a genealogy of all the dads that were part of Jesus' life up through Joseph. So, so Matthew starts with Abraham, and he talks about Abraham being the first person to receive a covenantal promise from God that God was going to make a relationship with Israel. And that promise is passed on and on and on to father to father to father to father to King David, which is why Jesus is called David's son, to father to father to father to father down to Joseph. So Matthew at the end highlights Joseph as the one who is passing this covenantal promise from Jesus, from Abraham, through him, to Jesus. Then we get to verse 18 where we started off today. And it's interesting because if I was to ask, who, who did the angel come to and call this person in Jesus' family to parent Jesus well into his life? The answer would probably usually be Mary, right? And Matthew, Joseph is the one who gets the angel call. Angel comes to Joseph and says, and says, so Joseph gives him this challenge. Will he be faithful to this, to this God who's telling him his wife will have a baby that's not his and raise this baby well? So Joseph has a chance to be faithful. And then later on in chapter 2, Jesus receives yet another call from the angel. The angel tells Joseph that the baby Jesus will be in danger, that King Herod wants to kill Jesus because he's trying to get rid of all the competition of kingship in Israel and Joseph needs to take Jesus down to Egypt to protect him. And so Joseph gets a second call from the angel. Joseph has to be responsible and faithful to that call. Joseph then gets a third call two years later while he's in Egypt to bring Jesus back home so Jesus can start his mission in Israel when everything is safe. Mary gets one call from an angel in Scripture. Joseph gets three and has to express faithful, faithfulness and loyalty and protection around his son three times. We're highlighting the roles of fathers in the faith life of their families. Why is father imagery, why is the role of father such an important part of a child's faith development? Not everybody has a good image of father, right? Many people here, well, maybe not many people here, but some people here probably. And there's probably somebody that, that you know, either personally or peripherally, who does not have a good image image of father, whose father growing up might not have been a protector like Joseph, or showed what faithfulness looks like like Joseph, or showed what loyalty looks like like Joseph. And so if that's us, and we see imagery of fatherhood in scripture, we tend to want to shy back from that. That doesn't make sense. How can I call God father if I don't have an image built in me in my own mind of what a holy father looks like? Father imagery is really, really important for kids growing up, because we use so much father, father imagery to describe faith. Notice for Jesus, the image of father that Joseph gives to Jesus. Of course, Jesus has to decide. Hebrews tells us he was tempted in, tempted in every way, just like us. Jesus has to decide someday if he's going to follow God's mission, even if it's hard. Jesus has to decide someday if he's going to protect God's people, even if it risks his life. Jesus has to decide someday who is he going to model his life after. He gets Joseph as this example of what a father should look like. And so when God calls him and God says, I am your father, Jesus has an awesome image to say, I know what that looks like. I know how to follow this. I know how to be like this. I've already seen it in Joseph. When father was faithful to Mary, despite the fact that, that he had suspicions that Mary might be pregnant by another man, Joseph showed faithfulness and trust towards Mary. Jesus learned faithfulness and trust from his father. When Joseph heard, heard God's call to do something risky, go down to Egypt to protect his son who was in danger, Joseph went, and then Joseph returned when God called. Jo Jesus, through Joseph, saw a man who was following God's call for his life, forming his decisions and his actions and his own words around God's decisions and actions towards him. So when Jesus was called to the cross, Jesus could more easily say, I know what that looks like. I've seen my father do this. Joseph gave Jesus his first images of what a holy father looks like. I imagine that made it easier for Jesus to follow his own call from his father in heaven. Now, there is a point, and you can tell me if this is, this is you too. Um, actually, little Drew's comment during the children's sermon helps with this. <laughs> 
There's a point where I'm, I'm writing and I'm thinking about this sermon this week, and I know I'm going with fatherhood, Joseph's fatherhood as an image of faithful fathering. And I get to the point where I'm like, I'm not Joseph. I, I don't know if you are all at that point yet, or if you've been listening and you're thinking, I hope the pastor doesn't expect me to be like Joseph or any other biblical character, because that's not going to happen. I hope moms haven't got to the point where they're making the checklist of who their husband is and how he's doing and saying, well, you do this well, you do this well, you need to work on this. That, that's not the point of today's sermon. And so if we're headed there, I'd like us to just hit the brakes and turn around, please. The point of today's sermon is that God has given all parents, especially fathers, yeah, all parents, power over our children power to guide them, power to give them values, power to give them a faith system and belief system. We have that power, and that is an awesome gift because there are other things in this world that would love to have that power instead of us. I brought two magazines. I, I regularly walk through grocery stores, just like all of you do. And I brought two magazines that, that think about these things. You may not, I don't know if you think about these things too, but the message is that, that our children and even ourselves will see on a regular basis from those things that would like power over us to shape and guide our own belief systems and the values and things that we have. And whenever I walk through, I hope this, don't fire me. You can't fire me before Christmas, right? <laughs> right? You know, we're going to show in church because I, I'm probably making a bigger deal out of this and now you're really curious than what it is. But if it's out there, we should talk about it in here. But I regularly walk by Cosmo. You guys walk by Cosmo magazines like Cosmo. And, and I know that there's a whole world out there that would have our children think, well, your belief system, your faith system, your value system should be, if you're, a, if you're a woman, you should look like this. Then you will have power in your society. And you should do things that cultivate image rather than character. And you will have value in your society. And, and, and if you follow along with this, you're going to be okay. And then I walked by... A, Dwayne, The Rock, Men's Health. First of all, I love The Rock. He's awesome. But if this is the image, and it says here, The Rock at age 50, if this is the image of where a little boy or even myself is supposed to go by the age of 50, that's not happening. He has eight hours a day to cultivate this body he puts on Men's Health. I got other things to do. There's too many fish to catch for that. But the image is... Do this, be this. Make your, 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 your value system one who builds power, who doesn't give it away. Make your value system one who takes power, who seeks to get to the top rather than lifting others up. Be a power taker rather than a power giver. And if you're like me, you want other sources of power to communicate to your children. This is for grandparents, aunts, uncles, mentors, parents, anybody who's part of a child's life what their faith system, what their value system, what it should be. The place I want us to land today is this acknowledgement that we have that power. Our kids are listening to us way before they're listening to Dwayne Johnson and Cosmo. We have been given that power. As Spider-Man said, with great power comes great responsibility. I want a different power than those things over and above the life of our children. God has given us that power. We see it in Joseph in how, in how Jesus models so much of who he is after Joseph. We see, we see Joseph be faithful towards Mary. And then Jesus grows up and Jesus is faithful to the mission of God even when it's hard. We see Joseph be a protector, getting Jesus out of Egypt or out of, out of Israel into Egypt to keep him from King Herod. We see Jesus growing up being a protector, protecting us from the power of sin, death, and the devil. We see Joseph being, being a person who makes his decisions around God's call for his life. And then Jesus goes to the desert, and the devil calls, and God calls, and who does Jesus follow? He follows the God, calls of God for his life. I always wonder, and, and you can tell me what you think about this, maybe Jesus, maybe God called Mary because he knew Mary was going to be married to Joseph. And Joseph was going to give Jesus this awesome image of how to follow his father in heaven. That's where I want us to land, to celebrate this, this God-given truth that we have power, a lot of power in our kids' life. Power to shape, 
power to form, power to guide belief systems, power to model. And we can use that. When we show faithfulness, we make it just a little bit easier for our kids to be faithful. When we show generosity, we make it just a little bit easier for our kids to grow up as generous people. When we show loyalty, we make it a little bit easier for our kids to grow up loyal. We have that awesome power. May we celebrate that power today and acknowledge that we have that power. And pray that God would guide us in using that power as we raise not only our kids, but all the kids we have a circle around into strong, faithful people. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, especially as we look towards baptizing little Bridget, we acknowledge our role as um, parents or grandparents or uncles or aunts or mentors or older siblings even, and that those below us in age are looking to us to see what we believe in, to see what we love, to see what we follow. Guide us, Lord, to model well who you are for us, that we can model well who you are for our littles. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of the day, very appropriately, Borning Cry. I invite everybody to please stand for our hymn of the day. be seated during this hymn. I apologize. The offering plates are going around. Turn your hearts, friends, and let us pray. Eternal God, you make the desert bloom and send springs of water to thirsty ground. 
Receive these simple gifts of bread, wine, and money, and make us messengers of your mercy and love for all in need of your healing and justice. We ask this through Christ our Savior. Amen. All right, Bridget, if you will bring your parents up here. I'll invite parents and sponsors to find yourselves around the baptismal font. Parents, you'll be here. Sponsors, you'll be here. Congregation, if you would turn to page 227, 227 in the red books, you will help us welcome little Bridget into the family of God. Okay, we got parents. Yeah, you guys can get close like you like them. There you go. Is there, you guys, why don't you hover a little, little center you over here? Come on this way, Brett. Yep. There we go. All right. Welcome. Bridget, you ready? In baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father frees us from sin and death by joining us to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are born children of a fallen humanity. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are reborn children of God and made members of the church, the body of Christ. Living with Christ in the communion of saints, we grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. Parents, called by the Holy Spirit and trusting in the grace and love of God, do you desire to have Bridget baptized into Christ? If so, please say we do. Thank you. As you bring Bridget to receive the gifts of baptism, you are entrusted with the following responsibilities. To live with her among God's faithful people. To bring her to the word of God and to the Holy Supper. To teach her the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments. To place in her hands the Holy Scriptures. To nurture her in faith and prayer so that she may learn to trust God. Proclaim Christ, the word and deed. Care for others and the world God has made. And work for justice and peace. You promise to help Bridget grow in the Christian faith and life. If so, please respond with, we do. Sponsors. You promise to nurture Bridget in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Spirit to help her live in the covenant of baptism and in communion with the church. If so, please respond with, we do. People of God, do we promise to support Bridget and pray for her in her new life in Christ? If so, please respond with, we do. We do. Yes, we do. I invite everybody to please stand. Together, we profess our faith in Christ and renounce the devil in all his ways as well. I will make three questions. You guys, if you agree, please agree, will respond with, we renounce them. I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? We renounce them. Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? We renounce them. Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? We renounce them. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Let us pray. O oh God, we give you thanks, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family, and through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection you set us free from the power of sin and death and raised us up to live in you. Pour out your Holy Spirit the power of your living words, that those who are washed in the waters of baptism may be given new life. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. May I have little Bridget? 
Is she awake? All right. Let's see. Thank you. Okay, Bridget, I'm going to switch you because I'm a left-handed baby holder. I know. Whoop. Gotcha. You can only do it with one. Bridget, today, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I know mine are still different than mama's. You did really, really well. Yeah. She loves you. Let us pray. Give you thanks, dear God, that through the water and the Holy Spirit, you give your daughters and sons new birth, that you cleanse them from sin and raise them to eternal life. Sustain on this day Bridget with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Bridget Dankers, child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen. Who's my sponsor? That's going to help me. All right. Will you light that candle from this candle? This is the Paschal candle from this one right here. It's the baptismal candle reminding all of them that they too share the same promises in their baptism that Bridget has today. And please speak these words to young Bridget. Sponsor, light oh, no, just, star. yep, right there. <laughs> Bridget, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. Thank you. Congregation, may I guide you in welcoming little Bridget to our body of Christ. We are together at the bottom of the liturgy. We welcome you into the body of Christ and into the mission we share Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to all the world. Amen. Thank you. So that candle can be lit on every baptism birthday that Bridget has, a reminder of these promises that, that we, the church, and God have made to her today. Just put it in your calendars, okay, December 18th. Um, when you do story time at light, you can add a little bit of scripture to the story as well. It's amazing what kids learn when you start reading to them when they're young. And this quilt was, was made by our quilters as a reminder that the prayers of the church are wrapped around Bridget, as well as this uh, baptism basket from our Christian care team. Whose job was it? Not mom and dad, but who's going to make sure all this goes home with mom and dad? Somebody. <laughs> Thank you. Can I have Bridget for a minute? Okay. You guys can all be seated. I'm going to go with my left hand again. It'll make her feel more comfortable. I got gotcha. you. So, uh, about the sermon, too. Um, nobody parents alone, right? And so, this little girl growing up to hear the name Child of God is now all our responsibilities because we promised it. And it's a reminder to all of us that there are kids in our lives who need people outside of their influence and power that share those promises of love and support and tell them who they are in God. And that is also our job, too. We've just added another one to our circle of care today. Bridget, everybody, everybody, Bridget. Thank you, guys. All right. I believe our service continues with a choir piece today. Is that right? Yes.
Thank you, choir. I invite everybody to stand. We continue with our prayers of the church. As we prepare for the fullness of Christ's presence, let us pray for a world that yearns for new hope. God, our shepherd. Let your spirit move with power throughout the church. Give discernment and wisdom to our bishops, pastors, deacons, and lay leaders. Take away our fear so that we serve and love, confident that you are guiding us. God, in your mercy. Our prayer. God, our source, awaken us to the beauty of the earth and the marvelous variety of life. Unite humankind in repairing and caring for your creation. Protect creatures and habitats in peril due to rising seas and warming temperatures. God, in your mercy. God, our vision. Raise up leaders in every nation who dream of freedom and justice for all people. We pray for the work of international organizations that promote peace and human rights, especially Amnesty International. God, in your mercy. God, our helper. Come to the aid of all who cry out to you. Shelter migrants, refugees, and those fleeing war and famine. Bring relief to individuals and families experiencing hunger, homelessness, or impoverishment. Comfort any who are isolated or lonely. God, in your mercy. God, our Emmanuel, you are with us in our life together. We give thanks for gathering us in worship and fellowship, and we remember those who cannot be present. Watch over those who travel. Heal the sick and speed their recovery, especially Keith, Dolly, Sarah, Judy, Nancy, Larry, Jan, Neil, Dave, Jen, Marilyn, Karen, Kelly, Peg, and the family of Joyce Balcom. God, in your mercy. God, our hope, you bring life out of death, and you promise to be our God forever. Shine upon the faithful who now rest in the fulfillment of your promise and bring us also into blessed reign of peace. God, in your mercy. God of our longing, you know our deepest needs. By your spirit, gather our prayers and join them with the prayers of all your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Take a moment to share that reading a piece with somebody near you. Peace, congratulations. Peace. Peace. Friends, we now turn our hearts and minds to the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Today, may the Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Remember again together today that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He broke it. He gave thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Christ took the cup. Having given thanks, having given thanks, he gave it to all to drink, saying, This is the new promise in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me.
Together we pray as Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may all be seated. I invite everybody to lay, take a, a look in the note regarding Holy Communion in the bulletins, especially if you're new to St. Luke Lutheran Church. Communion is open for all people. If you would like to receive a blessing in place of the sacrament, when you come up, just signal to me or one of the other service, servers by holding your hands as a sign of a cross across your chest, inviting blessing, or holding them like this. If you come up for communion, signal us by holding your hands open like that. Um, council members who are helping with communion, you may come forward. Choose the side. And I'll need one more council member with me. Thank you, Joe.
Friends, may this body and blood today of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you all and keep you in his grace. Amen. I invite everybody to please stand. We pray together a prayer of thanks for God's gifts in body and in blood. Let us pray. Faithful God, in this meal you have remembered your mercy, bringing heaven to earth in the body and blood of Christ as we wait for the day when all your promises will be fulfilled. Sustain us and strengthen us by this holy mystery. Guide us toward your promised future, coming to birth in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And on this day, as we wait to celebrate the incarnation of our Lord, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, guys. Friends, the world waits for Christ. You are the body of Christ. Let us go and be his hands and feet. Thanks.